In the previous lecture, we looked at the parasternal short axis view, and in that case, we looked at the aortic valve level. Now we're going to move down a little more towards the apex and look at the mitral valve level. Okay, so in this case, again, the patient position, they're in the left lateral decubitus position. You have the patient there. In the same, you're going to put the transducer in the same position as you had when you're looking at the aortic level. Okay, so again, in the parasternal short axis view, you want the transducer at the left sternal edge at the third or fourth intercostal space. Okay, so same place as you had it previously when you looked at the aortic valve level. Here, what we're going to do is, again, remember, we had, we went from the parasternal long axis view, which was here, okay, remember this is the right shoulder, this would be the left shoulder, and from the parasternal long axis view, what we did was we shifted 90 degrees, and so now we have the transducer marker pointed and directed towards the patient's left shoulder. Okay, remember this is the left side over here, and we're having the marker directed that way. Okay, so about two o'clock, patient's left shoulder, and now what's different from the aortic valve level is you have the transducer perpendicular to the patient's chest wall. Okay, and remember, if we want to look at more apical views, what we do is tilt the transducer's tail towards the patient's right shoulder. Okay, so the right shoulder here. All right, and now remember, tilting can give you either more apical or basal views. Remember the apex of the heart here, whereas the base of the heart here. So if we wanna look more at the apex, what we're gonna do is tilt the transducer towards the patient's right shoulder. In other words, towards this way, okay? If we wanna look at more basal views, so up here, as we did in the aortic view, we uh, then tilted it towards um, the patient's, away from the patient's right shoulder and almost towards their left hip. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so in the parasternal short axis view, we have different levels we're looking at. And what you can do is once you have it at the position, remember the left sternal edge, third or fourth intercostal space. And remember it's what we're going from is we're rotating the marker from the parasternal long axis view in 90 degrees uh, clockwise towards the patient's left shoulder, okay? And here we can tilt it either direction. If we want more apical views, so down here, okay, we're gonna tilt it towards the patient's right shoulder, the tail. If we want more basal views, okay, where we looked at the aortic valve level, we're gonna tilt it away from the patient's um, right shoulder, okay? so. Try to pause the video and think through it yourself, okay? But in this case, what we're doing is we are simply putting it on the patient's chest so it's perpendicular uh, to the patient's chest wall, okay? Again, the depth would, could be between 12 and 16 centimeters. Obviously, you, you can adjust that based on what's needed uh, and based on the patient's habitus. So what are we actually seeing in this view, okay? So I've tried to demonstrate this multiple ways um, so that you can see what we're actually visualizing. So if you look at here, I've labeled the views that we're looking at, okay? So notice, and then here's more of a cartoon depiction of it. So remember, the transducer is this one here at the top of the screen. This here is the marker. So in yellow, you could see that there as well as there. And notice that what is the most anterior closest to the marker is the right ventricle. So here's the RV, okay, right ventricle, and it would be this portion here. So what else do we see here? Well, we see the interventricular septum, okay, so between the left ventricle and the right ventricle, you have this interventricular septum, which is this portion here, okay, also labeled here. And then you have the left ventricle, which would be this here, so the LV. And then you also have the mitral valve, you can see here. So here's the mitral valve, and it's this portion here within there, okay? So the chambers that you can you wanna look for size and function are the left ventricle and the right ventricle, so the main ventricle. So again, here's the RV and the LV. And then we wanna look at the valves, we can look at the mitral valve. And also notice we can look at the systolic and diastolic shape of the interventricular septum. So if I erase this here, hopefully you can see that here's our septum in this region here.
okay? Now, you can also assess for any additional pericardial fluid, okay? If there's an effusion uh, by looking at, here's the pericardium, this white area along the back end of the image, okay, the lower portion. So let's just uh, review what we discussed here. So again, in the peristernal short axis view at the mitral valve level, again, you have the patient in the left lateral decubitus position. You have the transducer placed at the left sternal edge of the third or fourth intercostal space. If you're in the peristernal long axis view, okay, where we were directed towards the patient's right shoulder, what we're going to do is now rotate the transducer 90 degrees clockwise towards the patient's left shoulder, and we are going to keep the transducer perpendicular to the chest wall. Okay, if we want to look at more at the aortic valve level, in that case, we are going to move the transducer away from the patient's right shoulder. If we want to look at maybe more of a papillary muscle level, which we'll look at uh, in the next lecture, we're going to tilt it towards the patient's right shoulder. The depth, obviously, you can adjust, but often 12 to 16 centimeters should be sufficient. The assessment, what we want to look at are the chambers. We said that we saw that the left ventricle was this portion here. This is the right ventricle, okay? This was the mitral valve that we can assess. And in between here, this region here was the interventricular septum, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. You can also assess for any additional pericardial uh, fluid surrounding the heart in the setting of an effusion. So hopefully that makes sense. Well, that's the end of this lecture. I hope you learned something. Now, just to keep you in mind uh, of our course material that we have available, so again, if you go to our website, www.ekg.md, okay, so this is our website, and what you'll notice is that if you go to the EKG course here, okay, you'll find stuff that's separate. So notice that we have a number of topics, practice material, lectures, a way for you to contribute, and this is the course here over here. So you'll notice we have over 300 videos or so, and that's more on YouTube. There's another 100, more than 100, about 200 videos that are available with the course. So those are separate videos. And this course is really designed to take you from a beginner to advanced interpreter. Okay, so completely separate from what you're getting online for free. Okay, these are um, course material that comes with it. So notice that you have a book Okay, and then you also have the pocket guide available. So you can choose which format. They are the same thing, both these uh, book and the pocket guide, uh, different formats. Uh, I really like this small one because you can keep it in your white coat if you're in the clinic or in your pocket and it's really available on the go. Now with the book, you also get videos. So notice these are the videos, okay? And these are a video for every single page in that book. So it's over 30 hours of video. Now there's a number of practice material that I continue to upload there. Okay, we'll have practice questions coming soon. Uh, so all of that's available. Again, this is separate from all the free material that you get already. Okay, so this is more high yield stuff. This is what we used to teach our uh, technicians here and our students here at Mayo Clinic. And it's used now among many institutions. So use uh, check that out. Now, what it also includes are calipers. So yes, you get calipers with this course, okay? Um, I don't know anyone else that offers that, but you do get calipers. I think they're very helpful and they can, uh, you know, if you know how to use them correctly, uh, can help to identify different uh, arrhythmias that are going on, okay? And then you also get our pocket EKG reference, okay? This was something we've put together as we were developing course for the fellows, uh, and this is really nice. It has every code, as you saw earlier, laid out there, very small pocket guide available. I had help with uh, my colleague, Dr. Peter Noseworthy, who's the head of the EKG lab here at Mayo Clinic in editing it. So this is something that we use um, and we found very helpful. So go to the EKG course, you'll see examples of lectures, okay, why we developed this, okay, a lot of it came about from myself struggling with learning EKGs, having a father that was an interventional cardiologist and, you know, still struggling, so uh, my struggle is a struggle that I don't want you to have in learning them, okay, you can read all those introductory books, but honestly, they are not uh, enough, 
okay, and you find yourself using other resources, which is part of the learning process, I wanted to expedite that process for you and make it less uh, inefficient uh, in pretty much what I struggled with going and learning through EKG. So again, from beginner to advanced level with this course, uh, you get the book, the calipers, the coding reference, video access, okay? And now we're offering 25% off. 25% off, put that code in on checkout and uh, you'll have yourself 25% um, off that will even, it's pretty much covers the cost of what we use to print the material. So uh, we don't really make much off it. It's more to help our learners grow and really be able to contribute to patient care. That's why we do this and we love doing it. So thank you so much for your support. Um, if you have any questions, just leave them below and we're happy to answer them. All right, have a great day.